the story based the, the main part of the story takes place in the summer of, of 2009 with Mustafa, Samir, and Amal now all working for the newly formed Arab Homeland Security Bureau. And um, early on, they capture an Episcopalian suicide bomber from Boston, a guy named Gabriel Costello, who tells them this crazy story that the world they're living in is a mirage that has been imposed by God on the Americans as some sort of punishment. And um, in the real world, this guy says, America is the conquering superpower, and it's the Arab states that are the squabbling third world nations. And of course nobody believes this, but when they search the guy's apartment they find a copy of the New York Times from September 12, 2001 that appears to come from this other reality. And um, then they learn that other captured terrorists have been telling the same crazy story and other artifacts have been found. And now the Arab president wants an investigation into this question of the mirage. Um, and as the investigation goes forward, it turns out there are other interested parties. The gangster Saddam Hussein, who's always felt he was meant for bigger things, has been collecting artifacts from this other reality. And the, uh, mm -hmm. the head of the Senate Intelligence Committee, who's a war hero named Osama bin Laden, is very determined that nobody else look too closely at this. And um, so that's the story, basically. It's about these three patriotic Iraqis <coughs> squaring off against evil foreign terrorists and members of their own government. And, finding themselves caught between the Americans and Osama bin Laden. And, um, so that's the story. And uh, does anybody have any questions? <laughs> yes? Um, had this become a TV series, did you have any casting wish lists for any of the characters you produced it to? Honestly, no. I, I, the, the only name that I, I, I thought of, and it was just because I, I thought he could do it, would be Tony Shalhoub as Muammar Gaddafi, because he's sort of a comic. <laughs> Gaddafi in this world is, is actually, he's the, he's the corrupt governor of Libya, but um, he, he kills fewer people, but otherwise he's pretty much the same guy, and he's in there for comic relief. And mm -hmm. somehow I pictured Tony Shalhoub in that role. Um, but for everybody else, no. I, I would have been happy to go with unknowns, I think. And, and you know, as a joke, you could have Jake Gyllenhaal be the Persian ambassador. Um, <laughs> um, uh, but no, I, I never got to the point of, of playing the casting game, so. Um, anyone else? This book is, I mean, there's so much going on on so many different levels that I barely know where to start with a question, but I'll ask you specifically about how you envisioned uh, Saddam Hussein in this upside-down world, because it was very interesting to me that he went from, you know, being a dictator to being head of an organized crime family. I mean, that's that's a one of my rules in creating the Mirage world was that, that people's characters would essentially not change, so that people who were villains in this world would be, would be villains in that world as well. It was just that they'd have different opportunities in life so they'd express their villainy differently mm -hmm. and I'm not the first person to notice that probably the closest analog to what Saddam was in, in Western terms would be a, a mafia Don so mm -hmm. it, it just made sense to me that you could make him a labor leader, a labor racketeer and because of the war on drugs as a war on alcohol, a bootlegger so he's sort of a, a cross between Al Capone and John Gotti and then also that he's, he's this public figure who plays to the cameras and sort of is coy about the fact that he's a, a vicious criminal. Um, and it also allowed me to sort of work in the history of, of you know, the, the succession of Iraqi dictators and that you could have the other guys be rival crime bosses and so there's, there's sort of a version of the, the St. Valentine's Day massacre where uh, Faisal II, who, who was actually killed in, in the revolution that brought Ba'ath to power, um, in this case, he's on his way to a Labor Day parade, and he, he gets stopped by people in police uniform, and they, they machine gun him. And that's, uh, that's actually a different group of people who, um, who were then ousted by the Ba'ath Party and Saddam later on. So um, yeah, that just seemed like it, that, was, that was a pretty easy choice to make, that that would be the thing that he would be that was closest to what he really was. And, and I've seen a, a number of biopics that basically play that the same way that that you know Saddam is sort of the godfather of Iraq and so that's that, that just seems like an obvious choice um, and likewise bin Laden um, he's a rich man's son who was famous for going and fighting in a holy war and he's very tied into the political elite in in Riyadh and if he had not 
chosen to become a, an international terrorist, he could have been a pretty powerful guy within Saud society. So it made sense that in this world he would go into politics instead, but behind the scenes still basically be the same really vicious dude. So, um, yes? Yes? Do you see the this as a treatment in 2006? They, they asked me for ideas in 2006 and, and I basically presented it in early 2007 which was right right when the surge was starting to happen so it was the perfect time to try and pitch a story that would be seen probably as very unpatriotic um, so uh, yeah I, but I've, I, and I understand completely why TV on, on the one hand that you know like you can't do a show about the Vietnam War while the Vietnam War is going on but there's a part of me I think that that would be the perfect time to do it. That's the perfect time to create art that's sort of challenging and, and that that does you know interesting things. But uh, I guess people were just you know, a little too nervous about that. So did you spend about three years working on it then? I I mean the 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 no came relatively quickly, and then I sort of spent probably six months to a year trying to decide if I could really do this as a novel, whether I, you know, because on the one hand, the great thing is I could, I could do it exactly as I wanted it, I wouldn't have to compromise, but on the other hand, I was going to have to do all the research and work myself rather than having this fabulous research and team and a team of writers to do all the heavy lifting, so, um, but I eventually decided it was just too good an idea to let go, and uh, so, yeah, I, I probably started working on it in earnest in 2008. And once I had the first hundred pages, I showed it to Harper Collins and said, "You know, would you guys be interested in this?" And I said, "Yeah, actually, we would." So, um, and then I was off to the races. And it was just a question of finishing it in a reasonable amount of time while it was still somewhat relevant. And uh, I remember one of my my editor, who I first talked to about this, said, "Oh, you know, this is going to be relevant forever." And I'm like, "No, you know, eventually the war is actually going to be over, and people are going to want to forget this stuff." So. Um, but the timing seems to have come just about right. I, I finished the first draft literally a couple of weeks before the Arab Spring began. And mm -hmm. it was very weird to me because there's a sequence near the end of the book that reads like a metaphor for the Arab Spring, including Gaddafi saying at one point, no, oh, you know, we're next. And in a completely different context. But it was just, it was just very weird to have that, to write that, and then, I, was, you know, weeks and months later, I see it sort of, sort of happening out there, and it was very bizarre, so, and of course now no one is ever going to believe that it wasn't intended as a metaphor, it was just weird synchronicity, but, um, 